Welcome back to Nuts and Bolts Tort. One thing I forgot to mention that happened during the break is that Omni went and found a Mushroom Island. Or... Mushroom Island. No, it's Mushroom Island. It's a Mushroom Island full of mushrooms. I just love the mushrooms. They're just utterly adorable. Now, this is an exceptionally small Mushroom Island, but... Eh, gotta work with what you got. So we actually had a mushroom back at home. But somehow it got away, and I have no idea how. So this was its pen. Right here. Like, I can't imagine how it could possibly go away or disappear. It can't possibly get out of this. I don't see how it could despawn. I recently read, actually, that if you name tag something, if you give it a name with a name tag, it makes it so it won't despawn. And it was named. But somehow, I loaded up the game again, and it was just gone. Like when I recorded the very first episode after the break, I went back here and it just wasn't there. It wasn't on the minimap either, it just was gone. Let's go ahead and name them... Mabel. Mabel the Mushroom. Oh, they hurt a little bit somehow. 90%. Do I have any splash potions of healing? I don't think I do. I don't. I'll heal you at some point. Okay, back to R&D on the processor over here that I'm doing to prep for a new form of energy generation. So off camera, I did a little bit of testing, not too much. I didn't want to get ahead of what I could show you here. And I figured out how to um, integrate the processor with an RF tools screen and also make it so that you could interact with the screen to do something on the processor. So just completely forget the processor for now and let's just take a look at the screen. So the way screens work, is you place the screen down and then you have to provide it with power which comes not from an actual power connection but instead comes from a screen controller so you place the screen down you place down a screen controller just somewhere kind of in the vicinity nearby and then you have to scan and then it connects to the screen and then that basically brings it online so that's what you have to do to bring it online but as far as how you actually get something to display on the screen you put in these modules so there's all sorts of modules that you can put into the screen to display all sorts of different types of things. I'm sure there's a text, there's counters, there's ones that display energy usage, clock apparently, fluids, and so on and so forth. Oh, there's the text module for just displaying text. Shows you inventory. Elevator button module. Oh right, there's, yeah, there's an elevator in RF tools. And you can use the screens to tell it to go to different floors, I think. I've never really messed with it too much. Anyway, so modules are how you get stuff to display on the screen, but there's a couple of modules that are specific to RF Tools control, like these, variable and interaction. There's a couple more too. Actually, it looks like there's exactly four. Variable, interaction, console, and vector art. So if you want something, you know, some sort of interaction between the processor and the screen, those are the modules you want. So the variable one is pretty simple. All you have to do is just, I think it's sneak right click. Yeah, variable module is set to block. So you sneak right click on the processor. Um, and then if you put it in here, looks like it automatically did it. Then you can like give it a label and name it and stuff. But the most important thing is tell it what variable do you want to display. So I did that for this one. I set it to display variable zero. That's the uh, 165 there. Variable zero, I call it redstone. The room for text is extraordinarily small. It lets you type something really, really long, but it only displays three, four, five, six, seven characters. That's why it says redstone. <laughs> so that's displaying variable zero. And this increment, which is a button, that works. It's pretty cool. There's a very, very slight delay, but it's pretty fast. Um, that is the interaction module. So how the interaction module works is once again you assign it to the processor by sneak right clicking on it and um, this is just label and name and stuff but the important thing is the signal so the signal is button one that basically means when you press this button it is going to send the signal button one to the processor and what I've programmed it to do one of the events and remember events are the things that start processor actually processing it's an event driven thing one of the events is signal. So I have a signal on signal button one, it starts. So every time you press the button, it activates this thing, which adds up whatever's in variable zero 
and adds a one to it so it increments it by one and then stores it back in the variable. Hence why this works. Pretty cool. I don't know if I'm actually going to want any interaction like this with the setup I'm going to have for the power generation, but it's nice to at least know how it works. And especially displaying the variables is definitely going to be important because I'm sure I'm going to want to do some stuff with that. Okay, there's something else I've been wondering about. Let's grab this out. I want to test something. Let's just clear that. Okay. I want to test how it handles two separate unconnected pieces of events. Because I know it can do multiple events. I know it can do multiple events that aren't connected, but can it do them at the same time? And how I'm going to test that is I'm going to set an event that's just going to go like every... Every 20 ticks? Every second? So every second, I want it to just like output some text to the console. I'll just say like, hi. So every 20 seconds, it should output that. Now, let's set another one, an unconnected one, every 20 seconds. I want it to wait. And I want it to wait for, like, a really long time. So the question is, will it keep sending this message to the console? Or, meaning, uh, will it keep sending the message to the console and will this also wait? I mean, I'm sure it's going to wait, but will it be able to keep sending the message to the console while it's waiting? So is it doing this serially? Is it just doing, like, maybe it does this one, and then this one, and then it moves to this one, and then this one? Is it doing one at a time, or is it doing them in parallel? If it's doing them one at a time, then very soon it's going to hit this wait. Everything's going to stop, and it won't log this message anymore. Well, I think we have our answer, don't we? Yep. So we put it in again. We should see the high and then nothing. Okay, so it can switch between multiple events, but if you tell it to wait, it will just wait. It will not do anything in parallel. Okay. That's kind of what I expected. So I was thinking... Well, I'll get to that when I get there. I, I think I'm going to actually have to make a separate program for something I wanted to do because of that fact, because I plan on waiting for a while to take kind of like samples of data. And obviously I don't want it to stop working <laughs> while it's waiting. Okay. All right, uh, I'm going to go grab a fluid thing. There's some sort of a fluid thing that allows the processor to interact with the fluids. I'm going to go grab that and just play around with it and see how it works. Okay, so I'm going to test it with two interaction modules. I'm going to try setting it up so that the controls are able to take and place water, or take and give water into a tank. So we're going to have a multi-tank, which is the thing that apparently the processor uses to store and deal with fluids. I guess that's the only way you can interact with fluids, apparently. I'm going to put it on top of the node. Apparently it can store four different types of fluids. Not sure what those are. I guess they'd be filled if there was something in it. Let's place that there. Um, what is it set to on that side? None. Which I guess is good. If I told it to push, would it push? No. Good. Yeah, so you can't even pipe stuff into it, because that's not what it's for. It's only for RF tools control to be able to, to mess with it. Okay, that way it's right there, so we should be able to see it do stuff. Uh, in fact, actually, let's put this on top. I just need to make sure it's not set on, like, disabled or something on the side, because then it probably couldn't take any water from it. Okay, so let's try to program it. Also, let's get rid of this. that in, let's clear it. So, um, we're doing signals. So we're going to have two different signals. One is take water. And the other is give water. Examine liquid. Uh, so what kind of liquid operations do we have? Okay, so you can actually filter it based on liquids. And here we have push liquid and fetch liquid, which is exactly what we want. 
Um, it does say... Stores a result in an internal tank provided by a multi-tank adjacent to the processor. So it looks like it has to be next to the processor. It can't be next to a node. So I went ahead and moved it here. Okay, this should be pretty straightforward. So take water. Filter in liquids. We're going to fetch liquid. Oh, wait. It can be next to a node? Huh, maybe it's just the description that's off then. Maybe it can be next to a node. Okay. Right, um... That's optional, just the side we want to access the inventory. This side is... West. Yep. So, from the west tank... I don't know what the max amount we can take is, but let's just try, like, 5,000. So that's five buckets worth. And optionally, you can also specify the type of fluid you want to fetch. I guess if there's multiple types of fluids in whatever the tank is that you're extracting from. Fluid slot for the result, right? Because there's four slots. So I'll just go with slot zero. I'm assuming that's zero indexed. Zero, one, two, three. Well, it'll probably scream at me if it's not. So that was fetch. Now we want to push liquid. Yep, so it should be pretty similar, right? So we want to push to the west. 5,000 millibuckets. Fluid slot that we're extracting from zero. And that should be it, I think. Should probably evaluate. Yeah, okay. So that would tell you any error messages if anything was wrong. Okay. So, when I press take water, the fluid level in this thing should go down dramatically. Hmm. Missing internal fluid something, right? Oh, is it actually just cut off? Missing internal fluid. Huh. This is the west. Don't understand. Block that's capable of holding four types of liquids. When placed adjacent to the processor, it gives that processor access to four new fluid slots per tank, which can be allocated to programs so that they can work with liquids. Oh, just like you have to allocate it variables, you have to allocate it each program slots of liquids. Oh. I see. I think that was the problem. I think that was it. Probably the only problem. Okay, let's try it now. Take water. Well, it still didn't work. Uh, it didn't throw an error message, though. Okay, there we go. I got it all working. So at first I thought it was maybe a problem with the Ender IO water tank. Or, well, it's not specifically a water tank, just the Ender IO tank. Um, so I tried this basic fluid tank for mechanism. That was not the problem. The problem is I thought that the tank needed to be adjacent to the multi-tank itself. For some reason, I don't know why, there's really no reason to think that, but I thought this had to be, like, touching this. No, it just needs to be touching either a processor or a node. The tank that you're extracting from or pushing to. This, like this multi-tank, it needs to be next to the processor, but where it is doesn't matter. It's just like, it just like adds the capability to store fluid. That's it, it's like, it just adds the ability. It's nothing needs to be adjacent to it, it just needs to be adjacent to the processor, and then you can just pretend it doesn't even exist. Just adds more features to the processor. So, yeah, that works. Take water. Give water. Is it not able to grab the last little bit? Is it full? Oh, I think it's full. Yeah, I wonder if I could just transfer, like, unlimited amounts of water. I set it to uh, five buckets and it does that just fine. Hmm. 
Okay. I'm trying to think. How much am I going to want to use XNet versus just keeping everything within the processor? Well, I'm not sure, but I think we're ready to move on to the next stage of R&D, and that's actually starting to apply this stuff. So, I haven't mentioned what I actually want to use for power generation. Okay, I've got about a million things in my inventory. Hopefully I've got everything I need. So, one of the things about Deep Resonance is that when you generate power with it, it generates radiation, which has ill effects on things around it, including yourself, of course. So I don't want to put it in my base. There are materials that can shield you from the radiation. Uh, dense... Dense obsidian and dense glass can shield you from the radiation, but to make that, you need spent filter material. Which, to do that, you have to... Uh, technically, you don't have to generate power, but you have to purify some liquid, which I'll get into soon. But basically, if you want large quantities of this, you kind of just need to set up the thing. So I'm going to start with unprotected from... I'm going to start unprotected from radiation, and then once I've left it running for a while, then I'll probably cover it with something. And I'm also going to put it far away from my base. It just feels appropriate because of the radiation and all that. It feels like it shouldn't be in my base. It's kind of a dangerous thing. So I've got an idea for what I want to do. I think I'm going to put it on a platform out in the sea, probably out of render range. Not that it's going to be hard on the FPS or anything like that, but... I don't know, figure I should do some lag reduction because it's already laggy. I don't want to make it laggier if I can help it. So it's going to be far out in this direction, to the east. It's going to be a platform on the ocean, and then I think once I'm kind of done with it, I think I'm going to make an underwater tunnel that links back to the mainland. A tunnel that you can walk down and also where the power is transmitted through. But that is going to come later. So for now, let's make the platform. Let's go pretty far out here. This also gives me an opportunity to show you something super cool that I haven't shown you yet. It's actually another thing, not something that I really constructed during the break, but, well, I guess I crafted it, the formation wand from Astral Sorcery. So I've started using that, and honestly, for most applications, I think for pretty much all applications, I vastly prefer it to the builder's wand. It's like a super builder's wand. It's really different from the builder's wand, though, as you'll see in just a second. So this is pretty good. Let's maybe go a little bit further out. I'm just hovering with my jetpack, by the way. Turn on night vision so I can see. Okay, so first, with a formation wand, you have to sneak right-click on a block to select it. To say, this is what I want to build with. So I want to build with mossy stone bricks. That's set. Now, this is how it works. It basically projects out from whatever face you've hit, and it projects out to your current position. So, I'm aiming down, and if I'm like 20, if I'm like Y20 above where I'm aiming, then it will build 20 up. It's a very different way from building than with Builder's Wands, where you kind of put out the blueprint of what you want to make with a Builder's Wand, and then you use the wand to continue that shape. It's very different, but it allows you to construct, construct stuff a lot faster. So like, let's see how fast we can construct a platform. So I don't want this thing too far above the water. Maybe... Let's go a little bit higher. Yeah, like that. So, we can do something like... This. That's so sweet. I love it so much. Whoop. I can fix that mistake. It's also good for certain... It's like extra, extra good for certain things. Especially when building platforms that you want to have kind of like anchored to the ground and you want them to have feet like this. Like this foot here. Um, let me make this a bit bigger before I put more feet down. I hope I have enough bricks for this. 64, 40, okay, I should. I really don't know how big this needs to be. Deep resonance doesn't take a huge amount of room by any means. Yeah, we'll just go this much more out. Oh, am I out? Ah, oh, I'm out. I'm surprised it took so long for somebody to develop building like this. Because, I mean, 
I feel like forever, all types of builder's wands I have ever seen have always been that same type where they just continue a shape that already exists. None have beha behaved anything like this. Yeah, it seems like it's incapable, by the way, of making a single block. It seems like it has to be two or more. I'm not sure why that is. It's a bit strange. Okay, yeah, so if you want to make feet for your platform, you can just go like... Just made a support beam. It's so easy, I love it. Kind of spindly though. I think I'll make them a bit thicker. I'll be right back. Ah, ran out of bricks again. Alright, well, I'll construct the rest of that later. We got the platform, that's the most important part. Let's put... Oh. Oh, this is the wrong one. The illumination one is not what I want. But actually, I should show this too. This is another thing I made during the break that I haven't showed off. So the illumination wand from Astral Sorcery has two functions. The first one is to illuminate, like this. Let me turn off night vision. Makes a nice little light. I don't really like it because it looks kind of ugly. It's got these like piss yellow particles that just does not look good to me. And also there's no easy way to delete them. Unlike with the other illumination thing, um, where is it? Where's my normal, like, illumination wand thingy? I don't think it's here. But yeah, the normal one, you can just, like, insta-break them just by clicking on them. But with these, you have to place a block inside of them, and then that gets rid of them. Kinda sucks. But the other function of the illumination wand, strangely enough, is it can make blocks unbreakable. So if you sneak right-click, Makes them look like this. They Let me turn off Night Vision. So they output a little bit of light. A very, very small amount. They become sort of see-through. And they're completely invisible. You see at the top, on that tooltip, it says no tool. Meaning nothing can break it. So if you want something to be super strong, like Wither Proof. Which you haven't seen yet, but if you've played Minecraft before, you might be familiar with the Wither. Then I guess that's your go-to thing. weird. It can make lights and make blocks invincible. It's a very strange dual function. Um, yeah, I don't have my other wand with me for now, so I'll just put these down at the corners, I guess. I'll change that later. It's fine. Just turn my night vision on, too. That's mostly for monster spawns, I guess. Okay, let's start putting some stuff down. So, first things first... So I want to give you the big picture on how Deep Resonance works. So the basic idea is you put down a tank and a smelter. This tank needs to be filled up with lava, and then the smelter is going to take this resonating ore. It melts it down into liquid. You take that liquid and it has various properties about it. Um, every crystal has four basic characteristics. It has strength, efficiency, purity, and power. So strength is basically the maximum power that the crystal can contain. Efficiency is how fast you can get that power out of the crystal. Uh, purity is uh, determines how much radiation it produces when you actually use the crystal. And I wouldn't really call power an attribute or a characteristic. So I'd say there's three characteristics. I mean, power is just kind of a function of strength and efficiency, isn't it? So yeah, these are the various characteristics of a crystal. And when you first melt the resonating ore inside of this thing, it's going to be very low quality. So its its purity and its strength and its efficiency is going to be absolute garbage. You could, if you wanted, you could just take that, that liquid, you could put it inside of the crystallizer here, and you could turn that liquid, that crappy liquid, into a very crappy crystal, and then you have a crystal that doesn't produce very much power, doesn't produce it very fast, and produces tons of radiation. So if you want to produce a lot of power and you want it to be good and fast and not make everything sick around it, you really want to process it very well. And the way you process it is by using a... where is it? Infusing laser. So use an infusing laser on liquid inside of a tank to change its properties. Various different materials have different effects on the liquid. 
So if you supply an infusing laser with ender pearls, for example, um, you can see that it will affect the purity. So it will give it plus 2% purity. And that's per 2,000 millibuckets RCL 25 millibuckets crystal. Uh, we can just ignore that. I don't think that's too important for what we're going to be doing. But basically it gives it plus 2% purity. It has no effect on the other stats. And this here means the maximum number that it can hit. So plus 2% purity and it can go up to 100%. Other things have different effects. This is plus purity, strength, and efficiency. But you can see these only go up to 80%. 70, 60... 0%, this actually hurts the purity, gunpowder does. So there's all these different materials, they have different effects. So that's why automation is so important when it comes to deep resonance, because it's all about managing all these different materials and making sure that you don't ruin the purity, the strength, or the efficiency of what you're trying to make. Trying to make the best quality liquid you possibly can. And then crystallize it, and then use it. So it really involves a lot of automation. So, step one. The smelter. And the tank. We need lava. I've got a magma crucible here. And right now it's hardened. I'm going to make it reinforced and then signal them. There we go. Uh, also, I need power, of course. I'm just going to use a bunch of these wireless RF transmitters, I guess. Hopefully that's enough. Ooh. It's not working? What's wrong? Crit. Oh, grid power 1000 to 328. Oh. I don't entirely understand why extra utilities stuff was misbehaving, but uh, I'm going to supply the most power hungry thing, the magma crucible, just with an HV capacitor for now. And it is extremely slow, as always, so I'm going to throw some reception coils into it. Five hundred RF per tick. This thing's gonna drain super fast. I think I have the yeah. I've got the energy cube on it too, on here too. Let's do that. Make this eject. There we go. Now it's supplying the battery, which is supplying the magma crucible. A little bit of extra power. Anyway, that will hopefully be enough lava. This thing is so slow. God. Right. So, the tank needs to be supplied with lava, but it has to be supplied with a very particular amount between... Actually, I don't even need to look it up. I think it's between 40 and 60% full of lava. If the tank is below 40% or above 60%, then it will actually damage the uh, resonating ore that you put in here. I think it just... I'm not quite sure what it does. Makes it lower quality, or maybe it gives you less of it. It's not good. So, let's use xnet yeah so let's um, put this into a tank there we go let's throw xnet here let's get some connections let's I guess I just put one connection here this needs connection too that's output right yep I set to push and we are going to need some wireless RF transmitters for this. But just one shouldn't overload this system, or maybe it will. Grid power 402 out of 328. Not working. I, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, whatever. I'll deal with that in a sec. So, we're going to extract fluid from the tank. Let's disable it for now. Nothing that matters, it has no power. We're going to extract from the fluid tank, which has a lava, and we're going to output to the tank. And... Disable insertion if fluid level is too high. So let's set this to... That's not a percent, right? That's millibuckets. How many millibuckets does this hold? Let's put a bucket of lava in and just see if that tells us how much it is. Okay, yeah, as soon as you put some in, hold 16. Okay, so what's 60% of 16? Uh, 60% of 16 millibuckets is 9.6, so it's 9,600 millibuckets. Thing is, though, if you look at the wording here... Oh, conduit connector. Where's it connect? Oh, stop connecting. There we go. Ugly, ugly image. 
So if you look at this, it says disable insertion if fluid level is too high. The thing is though, we're going to be transferring a thousand millibuckets at a time. That's the default. There's no reason to change it, really. I mean, I could change it to one millibucket at a time, but it'd be excruciatingly slow. And I don't know how much of the lava is going to be taken up when we use the smelter, so we could have uneven amounts. Point is, I'm wondering... Is this... Disable insertion of fluid levels too high. Is that going to insert too much and then disable inserting? Or is it going to make sure that it doesn't go over that number? If you know what I mean. So let's just test it right now. Let's just turn this on and see what it goes to. Why is that doing nothing? Oh, I put a quantum entangle porter here, by the way, to take care of our power needs. I kind of forgot I had that. Ah, oh, I was getting real confused there. Turns out you can configure the sides. In fact, I just did it a second ago accidentally. You can configure the sides of the tank. That's why I wasn't accepting anything. Let me just put that back there. Restore what I broke. Okay. Yeah, I don't need the rate. I just, I tried a bunch of stuff that didn't work. There we go. Okay. Should not go above 9,600. If it does, then I need to set it. I need to change it. Ah, okay, good. So it's smart about it. It doesn't go over and then stop transferring. It makes sure that it doesn't go over. Okay, so we're right at 60%. From what I understand, the more lava that's in it, the faster it uh, smelts, the ore. And since the safe range is within 40 to 60%, ideally you'd be 60%, or as close to it as you can get, just for faster smelting. Not that it's a big deal. Anyway, let's throw in some resonating ore. I'm a little bit skittish to throw in too much. Let's put in, I don't know, eight? Is it... Is it doing something? It doesn't look like it's doing anything. That should be going up. Hmm? You need a tank below it filled with lava, and a tank above it which will be filled with RCL. Oh, 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 oh. Right, the smelter doesn't actually hold anything itself. It needs another tank. Which I have right here. Okay. There we go. Well, I can get rid of that then. I was going to extract the fluid. No longer. Set that to extract. Set that to insert. Not that I plan on doing that just yet. So this thing is... Yep, it's filling up. Okay, so you see the quality is 100%. Which is good. That means... Whoop. That means our lava amount is perfect. So the quality would be lower if the lava was not correct. I don't think any of the things that you use on the crystal through the laser can influence the quality. I'm pretty sure that's purely a result of the whole lava thing. So that's 100%. That's good. You can see the default purity, strength, and efficiency is 10%. So the quality might be 100%, but it's garbage. <laughs> Complete garbage. I'll put eight more in there. That's so cool looking. Oh my god. Stop doing that. So, let's see. That's going to make 16. Let's see how much fluid we get out of 16. Let this final one finish. 3,200. Okay. I'm not sure how many buckets we need for a crystal. But, I think it's something like... I don't know, I feel like it's somewhere around like a stack of resonating ore to make a crystal or something like that. It requires quite a bit. These crystals can hold, I think, billions of RF. If I remember right. Okay, so next step. We have the stuff that needs to be purified. And it needs its strength increased and efficiency increased. But the first thing we're going to want to do is get the purity up. That's the easiest thing. Um, let's put some purifiers down. I believe they can purify in place. As in, I think they can purify the liquid that's just in the tank, and they just put it back in the liquid, if I remember correctly. They need power? No, looks like they don't need power, but they do need filter material. Okay, I've got the filter material. Let's go ahead and transfer the stuff, so... Uh, I should probably name these, huh? So let's name this one Lava. 
Let's name this one. Mm, just melted. I'll name this Purify Tanks. Just so I can tell all these different ones apart. Because they all look the same. So we want to go from the just melted. Whoop. Let's make a new channel. Fluid, turn it off. Just melted. Extract and go into the purify tanks. There we go. Okay. Now for these to purify, they need the filter material. Hmm. Do they need power? I don't see any RF at all. Oh, it looks like you can purify it in place, but the tank just does need to be above or below it. But you don't have to have two tanks above and below it. You could just have one, and it sounds like it works. Also says the quality of the liquid is not... If the quality of the liquid is not very good, you may not be able to purify it as high as 85%. So the max you can purify it to just using the purifier is 85%. And if the quality is low, that is, if we messed up the lava amounts and didn't keep it between 40 and 60%, then we wouldn't be able to purify it as high. So I guess that's the negative effect of it. Okay, well, let's change this. Oh. It's weird when blocks come back. So let's put the purifiers down here. I guess, just for the sake of making it really fast, I'll put three purifiers down and three tanks, because the tanks form a multi-block structure. So any fluid you pump into, like, if you pump fluid into this tank, it'll spread out to all the tanks. So this should be three times as fast as having an all-in-one tank with one purifier. Okay. Let's make this a connection. There we go. Let's make that input. Yes. Wait a minute. Did we just... Oh shit, did we just destroy the liquid, or please tell me it stays. Okay, whew, whew, it stays. Good. How do we get it out now? <laughs> uh, no need to. I'll just do this, there we go. Yep, oh yeah, look, you see the purity going up really fast. 30%, 40%. It's cause there's not very much of it, plus it's going at three times the speed of a single one. And you can see it's spitting out the spent filters, which we need to make the dense obsidian to protect against radiation. Apparently it will spit out that stuff just out into the wild, unless you put a chest nearby. So let's do that. I only brought two, though. Okay. Um, where to go from here? Because I can't get that much further without starting to automate this stuff using the computer. Let me think. Okay, let's just do some brief testing with the laser. I also went ahead and replaced all the power cables with just uh, more XNet cables, since I realized even though I don't use XNet cables to transfer power very often, I already have XNet cables all over the place here, so why not just make it all XNet? This is of course all going to be facaded once I'm finished with the cabling for this place, so it looks ugly now, but it'll look a lot better later. So let's try the infusing laser. So for the laser to work we need a couple things. It needs to be facing the tanks, which it is, but the tanks also need a lens on it, like that. There we go. So wherever the laser hits the tank, it needs a lens on it. And I think it needs a redstone signal, pretty sure. And it also needs two things to be supplied. So you need the, I guess it's the catalyst, the thing that's going to change the properties of the fluid. So I'm going to go with something very cheap and innocuous which is ender pearls. All they do is just make the purity plus 2%, up to a max of 100%. No negative effects, so they're not going to destroy anything. However, every time you shoot a laser into here, it costs... Um, I'm not sure what this is called, but basically it takes stuff from crystals. Crystals are the finished product that you can use to make energy. Um, but thankfully, I have found some just over the many, many hours I've played this mod pack, I've just found some in the wild. They're pretty rare. They're actually really rare. And the ones you find are complete garbage. If you look at the strength, efficiency, and purity, it's usually around, like, 
one and two percent for the first two and maybe around ten percent for purity like there's really bad crystals but you can toss them in here and just melt them or whatever they become there okay now we got some stuff whatever this stuff is so let's see if we can affect the purity so right now it's 85.1 percent this should make it go up Oh, does it keep you? Oh, it just keeps using it up when it's supplied with a redstone. Okay. Now it's eighty-six percent. I see. Yeah, that plus two percent is per a given volume of the fluid. I think it actually said how much, didn't it? Let's look it up. If you look at the laser and the uses for it, it shows it here. I like looking at it here more than in the book. I think it's a little bit nicer. So that's per two buckets. Yeah. So. For two buckets, it'll increase the purity by 2%. And we've got like, I don't know, 10 buckets in there or something. A bunch. And it also uses 25 millibuckets of crystal. Does everything use the same amount of crystal? 25, 25? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to need to figure out exactly what sort of resources I want to use to make the best crystal. Without destroying it. And I say without destroying it because some of these have negative effects to purity. And if the purity goes below... Or if the purity hits 0% or goes below it, um, it actually destroys a large amount of the liquid. And this is like a stack. Actually, I think this is exactly a stack made 12.8 buckets worth of this stuff. So if you destroy a lot of it, you just lost a lot. The resonating ore is not that easy to get. It's quite rare. I mean, I've only collected like two stacks of resonating ore in my entire time playing this game. So, <laughs> yeah, it's uncommon. Okay, so there's a laser working, and it need works, so... I was thinking I would have to maybe transport this fluid outside of these purifying tanks. And then go through, like, a like a laser tank, and then put it back in the purifying tank. But I don't think I need to do that. I can just do it all in tank. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is going to be the basic setup for how stuff is going to work. Um... Let me go over what I want the program to do, because I'm going to be using the computer to manage this stuff, right? So what exactly is the program going to be doing? I'm going to write it out so I get a better idea of that. Okay, so I've laid out four kind of major characteristics that I want my whole computer deep resonance system to have. So I want the computer to be able to trigger the laser, or lasers if we're going to have multiple ones, I'm not sure yet. I want it to trigger them when purity is 85%, and I want it to stop when purity is below 85%. That's to make sure that purity doesn't drop down too far and potentially destroy some of the liquid. So we only want to fire the laser when it's been purified as much as the purifiers can, can purify it. This is kind of like a safety mechanism and all that good stuff. Um, and when everything is good, when the purity and the strength and the uh, efficiency is good, then we need to send it to the crystallizer to become an actual crystal. Um, I also want to make sure that this doesn't overproduce. So if there's already a spare crystal, like if we're producing power with a crystal and we also have a spare crystal in the waiting, then I don't want it to produce more. Because each crystal holds a huge amount of power. So if we've got one going and a single crystal buffer, then I just want it to stop. Just don't, don't do the thing. And I also want it to stop everything if anything is missing. If anything is missing that's going to hurt the quality of the fluid, just stop. And I want it to report accurately what the problem is. So hopefully like it displays a message in the console or on the display or something like that. And this could be any myriad things. It could be we're out of... Uh, we're out of filter material and the purifiers. It could be we're out of ender pearls or whatever we're putting in the laser. It could be that we're out of lava, etc., etc. So there's a lot of different characteristics that, or a lot of different uh, things that could happen to trigger a shutdown. So all of these are kind of big, except I suppose maybe, maybe these two. These two are probably relatively easy. Uh, but the first one and the last one are going to be a lot to unpack, and I have no idea how I'm going to tackle them exactly. Especially the laser. 
I don't know. See, do I want to use a single laser? Because I'm not going to be able to use a single item in the laser to get everything that I want. I'm going to have to use multiple items. And if I use a single laser, then that means I'm going to have to switch out items. And I'm not sure how I would want to go about doing that. But anyway, I'll figure it out. So these are the big goals of what I'm going for. So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, I'm going to get started on my first large-scale RF Tools Control program.